Considering home security? Consider this. For 140 years, ADT has helped stop more crime than any other home security company. The yard sign isn't just a sign. It's a line in the sand. It's no wonder five times more people choose ADT to protect their homes. Visit ADT.com to learn more. For license information and terms and conditions, visit ADT.com. Here we are, back in Better Than Ever, Mike and Mike, presented by Progressive Insurance. Our guests on the Shell Pennzoil performance line, and you know what? It had to go seven. This series, this season, has been too good to finish with anything less. The Dodgers win last night, so all the chips go to the middle of the table. Tonight, Golick, one game to decide the World Series. We always have firsts in baseball. There are more numbers than any other, you know, in any other sport. Numbers, numbers, numbers. And the first last night was the first time the Astros walked off the field with Verlander pitching with a loss. Correct. How about that? Yep. I mean, he had been just an unbelievable get for them. Uh, the regular season, certainly the postseason, and he, and he pitched well uh, last night, giving up the two runs, though. Well, interesting, two runs to the 8-9-1 batter, so he comes out after that, not wanting to face uh, them, him to face the heart of the order. But that was that was the first, because he was dealing early. You thought, man, if the Astros could put a few runs on the board, this one's going to be tough for the Dodgers. Problem is, the Astros couldn't put a few runs on the board. No, and they had all kinds of chances yeah, in did. that fifth, and then again in the sixth, and then again in the seventh. And they can't get the big hit when they need to on the road. It seems that they hit home runs at home, and then they just can't score when they get away from home. The same thing actually happened with the Yankees in this postseason, and now it's been the case with the Astros. It's been a, a magnificent series, yeah. and obviously it's a jam-packed morning with the first college football rankings right. last night. I told you Notre Dame was going to be right up there. You did, and they are. Um, and indeed they are, and we'll have plenty of that for you this morning as well. There's a ton to get to. Let's start it off fast off here. Let's top, go right off the top. top. Dodgers force a Game 7 with a 3-1 win in Game 6. Yeah, uh, impressive, and it was Jock Peterson, the seventh inning. He hits that home run, became the fourth player in franchise history with at least three home runs now in a World Series. Reggie Smith, Davey Lopes, and Duke Snyder did it a couple times. And he has an extra base hit in five straight games, tying the World Series record most recently done by Amos Otis in 1980. So big hit for him. Certainly different from the the big offensive explosions out of Houston where we've seen double-digit hits. I think they only had six last night. Uh, so, you know, as far as pitching Rich Hill through another, it was ticked again. That's your guy. He, Golick <laughs> has fallen in love with I Rich knew, Hill. I, I don't I, blame I, you. I'm I don't such blame a you. fan of Rich Hill. 18 batters in the yank him. He's throwing well. 19 batters last night. He's throwing well. He's throwing stuff in the dugout. He's all ticked off. And in comes Brendan Morrow, who the last time we talked about him, we talked about his six pitches where he got destroyed. And he came in and got the jo- job Facing done. Facing the, the extraordinarily hot break man, and they get and, out of the inning. And then Kenley Jensen, he finishes it up six up six down three strikeouts that's what their bullpen has been used to doing it's amazing what they can do with a little rest and so on we go to game seven the world series and the season will culminate tonight in a winner take all game seven in la lance mccullers and you darvish darvish you know just got shelled uh in uh in game three when he started mccullers I didn't have great control, I had four walks, did give up a few runs as well, but certainly threw better than Darvish, who struggled. So they'll be looking for you to obviously pick it up tonight. But listen, it's game seven. You're waiting for when's Kershaw coming in? When's Keiko coming in? You know, I mean, th- this is for a league that plays 162 games, lives its postseason by a series. Now this is like my sport football. Winner take all, one game. Loser, your season's over. You're known as a World Series loser, Wizzer, uh, winner. The confetti drops on you. Back to back years, we get game seven. Off the top. All right, top. Georgia is number one in the initial release of the uh, college football playoff rankings. Is that very significant? I think it is. But obviously it's what comes after Georgia and Alabama that is really significant, and we'll talk about that in a few minutes. Yeah, there's a lot to talk about with this. To me, I don't think it's overly significant with Georgia 1 and Bama 2, knowing that they meet up, they can, in the SEC title game. The one common opponent the rest of the way is going to be Auburn. Auburn can muck it all up, possibly, uh, because they play both those teams. First time Georgia has been ranked uh, since they were number 9 in 2014. Alabama used to have it at the top. Notre Dame was the one where a lot of people like you thought they'd be in. I was I was kind of holding my breath on that and seeing where that was going to happen. But I, to me, it didn't matter if they were in. If they were right in or if they were five or six first ones out, rarely, you know, only, we, were you, we never see more than two from the initial rankings end up in the final four in the last rankings when it counts the most, and we'll get into that more. 
uh, but they end up being uh, number three, Clemson number four, and they did put Oklahoma ahead of Ohio State. They, it looks like they did take the head-to-head into consideration without question here as Oklahoma is one slot above Look, I think I, I think it does matter, and I, what I said to you yesterday was watch where they are in relation yep. to Clemson, and, and – but. So they, they, they put them ahead of Clemson, but they put Clemson, they gave Clemson enormous respect. They did. Yes, which they I did. think is accurate, with, uh, appropriate. Anyway, we'll get it. We'll yeah, get, yeah, uh, yeah. There's a lot to get into. Uh, get, you know, all of that yet here. Uh, the NFL trade deadline comes and goes, and a lot of deals. We talked a lot yesterday about some of the big trades that were made. The Ajayi deal goes down right towards the end of our show. And then as the day went on, Kelvin Benjamin traded from Carolina to Buffalo. Yeah, he was the third leading receiver uh, behind McCaffrey and behind Funches, but it was close there. He got, This is a former uh, uh, first-round pick. On trade deadline from 2014 to 2016, on the trade deadline day, there were three trades during those three years. Yesterday, there were three trades on the last day, and there could have been a fourth. There could have been a fourth. Close, but no cigar. <laughs> Between Cincinnati and the Cleveland Browns, another thing we'll get into. Well, my goodness. I you mean, want to talk about I, 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 bordering on ridiculous I, at this I, point. I, I off the top. Uh, top. Finally, uh, the Zeke Elliott thing. Oh. Is it finally over? Is, th- is this a final decision now? Is this suspension now in place and he's going to miss the next six games? Because just when it seemed like that was the news yesterday, I, you get word that, well, there's still another court that the – Players Association can take this, too. So I guess we're still not 100% certain if Zeke Elliott is going to be suspended right now. First thing the Players Association did, they asked the judge uh, who made the last ruling to suspend her Monday ruling, reinstating the suspension during an who re, She reinstated the suspension during an appeal. The union asked her to don't do that or not suspend that, that right? take that away so, so Elliott can play. She refused, so the file has moved to the appeals court, and your guess is as good as ours. Yeah, seriously, we're going to stop following that. At at some point, we'll just put the game on this weekend, and either he'll be on the field or he won't. Exactly right. That's Mike and Mike, and it's off the top, and that's presented by Progressive Insurance. They'll compare rates for you so you get the best deal, even if it's not with Progressive. Saving you time and money, now that's Progressive. Call or click today. And just to be clear, so that anyone listening might not get the wrong impression, if this matter that is being adjudicated involving Zeke Elliott had anything whatsoever to do with domestic violence, then Mike and I would certainly not be treating Without it question. flippantly in this yes. manner. That's an extraordinarily important uh, situation and an extraordinarily important topic that began all of this. Right. But that has, this has long since ceased to be about that. Right. What is happening in court right now between the, the owners, between the commissioner and the uh, and, and the Players Association, with Zeke Elliott in the middle of it and Jerry Jones on the outside throwing daggers, has nothing whatsoever to nothing. do with what Zeke Elliott did or did not do. And that is the reason I think that it is okay to say, listen, I'm sick to death of we the are. back and forth. Just make a decision already. As simply as we can put it, as simply, you, you tell me if we can make it even simpler. The league put a committee together, but basically at the end of it all said, we have the power through the CBA to do this, and this is what we're doing. And the union has basically said, well, even though you have that power, you did it wrong. We don't like the procedure and the way you did it, so we're going to fight it in court. Yeah. And that's where we are. And, and the union, I think they, they have a vested interest in fighting it because what has happened is the, the collective bargaining agreement gives basically unlimited yep. power to the commissioner. And the only way the union can get that away from him is to find a court that rules that he handled it wrong. So they just keep trying and they keep looking and they tried with Brady and now they're trying with Zeke and we'll see. And the irony in all of this is that Jerry Jones is on the outside who could not have been more supportive of Goodell during the deflate gate thing. Right. And now all of a sudden this is an overcorrection. Overcorrection that he called by Roger Goodell and he's, the one that seems to be gumming up the works for Roger Goodell's uh, extension. So we don't know where that's going to go between owner and and uh, and uh, uh, owners and the commissioner. But to your point, I don't remember the last time we mentioned the words domestic violence no. in this case. And, and and again, that would be the important issue here. Remember, Zeke Elliott, uh, by uh, under the law, is not getting in any trouble for this at all. It was the league's own investigation doing this. But to your point, just like the fight gate, it has stopped being about the actual thing the player was suspended for. All right, tonight, 820 Eastern time in Los Angeles, the 39th. World Series winner-take-all game of all time. And if you're wondering just how significant home field advantage is, it isn't at all. (laughs) Amazingly, in the previous 38, the home team has won 19 times and the road team has won 19 
times. Actually, the last two World Series Game 7s have been won by the road team after the home team had won nine in a row. But in 2014, it was San Francisco taking care of business behind Madison Bumgarner. And then last year, of course, it was the Cubs in extra innings beating your Indians right. in Cleveland. The last time the Dodgers played a winner-take-all game in the World Series, their starting pitcher was Sandy Koufax. That's how long it has been. This will be the first ever Game 7 yeah. of the World Series in the history of Dodger Stadium, which after Fenway and Wrigley is the oldest ballpark in the majors. So there is an enormous amount of history, an enormous amount of color. It just doesn't get any better than what we're going to get tonight. And, and this feels like a series that should have gone to seven games, right? With all we've talked about them, you know, the hitting of Houston, the pitching, what was Kershaw, what's his legacy going to be? And right now, for him individually, he would need to get into this game and throw well, right, uh, for it to go in the positive direction. Yeah, if they win the World forward. Series, then he, he gets to celebrate, of course, and uh, he, he isn't the GOAT, right. but he if, if he goes out there and he has a Bumgarner-esque kind of right. performance, he doesn't have to go five innings or whatever Bumgarner pitched that night, but if he goes out there and does anything then uh, in a positive way, then it certainly makes a difference. Yes, this series has... For all the good that he did in this postseason, this series has not helped his legacy one way or the other. And what I'll say this morning is this. if you were, a, I said before Game 6, if you were a Dodger fan, you were going to remember the lead and your closer had the ball in his hands in Game 2. Right. And the lead and Kershaw had the ball in his hands in Game 5, and you couldn't get either of those games won. Now I think you're going to say the same thing if you're the Astros and you lose. For whatever it's worth, and I know it was only one nothing, but you had the lead and you had Verlander on the mound and a 3-2 lead in the World Series. You did. With, with, with Verlander, who has been basically untouchable and looked like he was going to be untouchable last night. Yep. If you wound up losing tonight, that's what you look back on. As I said, he gave up two runs uh, and, and to the 8-9-1 hitter, so he didn't come back out. Uh, and then it was Musgrove who gave up the home run to Jock Peterson, and that made it 3-1. to one. So... Uh, you know, we, we move on to this, and it's interesting. We talk about the Verlanders. We talk about the Kershaws and the U Darvishes, and, the, and, and I talked a lot about Rich Hill. But it worked last night how the Dodgers wanted it. You know, Rich Hill throwing his four innings, or in this case, into the fifth inning, mad for it getting pulled. But this time, the bullpen had, a, had some rest. So, they, they uh, again, Morrow comes in after we talked about his six pitches, and he goes in and gets the job done. Watson, Maeda, and then Jensen does what he's supposed to do. Six up, six down, three strikeouts, just with that bullpen we talked about before the series started, their strength. So let's see what happens tonight. But the name tonight, Lance McCullers, he's going to start this game. He saved Game 7 of the ALCS. So he'll be the first pitcher in postseason history to start a winner-take-all game after saving one earlier in the postseason. Madison Bumgarner did this in 2014, but in reverse order. Correct. In the reverse order. Ever. Right. So McCullers, you know, not the name pitcher in this series by any stretch, got a chance to really light it up for him. He's been very good in these playoffs. I mean, I think you feel good about it if you're the Astros. Look, you can slice this thing up any way you want. Let me play a Mark Teixeira. Mark Teixeira on where the advantage is right now. To me, the momentum has completely shifted. Yeah. We left Houston. We thought that Houston had all the momentum. Now, with the Dodgers having, you know, basically a rested bullpen again, and the Astros not being able to score runs, you got to think the advantage goes to the Dodgers. Yeah, I would think so. Right in Game Seven at home, I, I don't, I, I don't think so. I'll tell you why I don't. Here's the thing. The Astros cannot score on the road. All right, Altuve and Correa. Oh, th this stat is amazing. Yeah, I'll let is, you read it. This is what to keep an eye on, the three and four hitters for Houston. In their seven Houston wins this year, they've batted 435 between the two of them. In the six losses, 070. I mean, that that's it. So if they're not hitting... Houston hasn't been winning. They've driven in 17 runs in their seven wins and zero runs in their six losses. So obviously that has to change. But the single biggest statistic in this series has been the bullpen. With at least one day of rest, the Dodgers bullpen has thrown 12 and two-thirds innings in this World Series, has not allowed a run. With no rest, they've allowed 14 earned runs in 15 innings and nine home runs. So tonight they're on no rest. Right. So last night they were on rest. They had a day, they had a day of travel. So when they had the rest, games one, game three, game six, the bullpen again has not allowed a run. With no rest, games two, four, and five, they've allowed 14 runs in 15 and a third innings. So to me, that's an enormous number going into tonight. Plus, you pointed it out. Darvish got was all the conversation after the game what? three really centered around the incident with Guriel and right, Darvish. Right. And, and correctly and understandably so. Agreed. But lost in that is the fact that, that Darvish got lit up. How quickly they had to get to the bullpen. And if they have to do that again tonight. 
Now, the, tonight they will go to Kershaw, exactly I would assume, right. yeah. and, and who knows what that means. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's, the, that's the beauty of this, is when you bring in someone like that, it's like, what are you going to get? This is where you can, like, like Bumgarner, stamp something that says, you know what, your money in the postseason, or... You know, a guy still kind of searching for that for that legacy in the postseason. So, look, the 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 thing that the Astros have to figure out a way to do is is, is score away yep. from home. They're two and six on the road so far in this postseason. It's exactly the same thing that they had in their series with the Yankees, where the home team won all seven of the games. That wouldn't be the case in this series, obviously. But the offensive numbers have just been have been disproportionately different based upon the ballparks they're playing in. So if you look at it that way, then you say, yes, advantage to the Dodgers tonight. But I look at the bullpens, which is where I think this series has basically been decided in the Dodge, in, in the games the Dodgers have won, and I think that tonight the advantage in that regard goes to the Astros. I actually, as much as Darvish has been a stud, I kind of like the way McCullers has been pitching. I kind of like him tonight going into the game. Yeah, uh, a game three again, he had four walks. I think he gave up three or four runs, but, you know, that – Compared to Darvish, who <laughs> was uh, it was it's pretty stark difference. So uh, that's where we stand right now. Again, a game seven tonight. You will hear all of the action right here on ESPN Radio. I can't ask for any more than this series has given us and is going to continue for one more night. Meanwhile, the college football rankings brought to you by the 2018 Ford F-150. It doesn't just raise the bar. It is the bar. And so last night, no surprise that the two big boys from the SEC finished one and two. Maybe a little bit of surprise, the order in which they went. Georgia 1, Alabama 2. Is that the committee trying to send a message? Is that who, It could be anything. It doesn't make any difference. Georgia has the best win uh, between the two of them by beating Notre Dame by that one point. And so they're 1, Alabama is 2. Notre Dame is 3, Clemson is 4. Followed by Oklahoma and Ohio State, 5 and 6. Penn State 7, TCU 8, and then the unbeatens, yeah. Wisconsin at 9, and Miami at 10. Let me tell you what, that, that you want to start looking at and this is what you do. You kind of look for your team. Where are they? Why are they there? There's a couple of teams to look at. We were wondering where they were going to put Wisconsin. And you saw, they, you just said it. They put them at 9, and they put Miami at 10. I mean, so th- those are two, I think, fan bases that are going to be a little upset at that. The bottom line is you're going to have a chance to do something about it. For Miami, outside of the ACC title game that, that – would come with if, if they are successful in what I'm about to say, where they could pl- probably play Clemson and really. If you're a Miami fan, if you take care of your business, I believe you're going to be there. 100% Because agree. your road is this week, Virginia Tech, which is ranked 13th. Next week, Notre Dame, which is number three. And then if you get to the ACC championship game against Clemson, they're sitting at number four right now. You win out. You win all those games. Totally agree. I'm telling you, you're you're going to be there. So... While you're sitting at number 10, and we've seen teams outside number four, and we'll get into that, that make it in the final ranking. And quite honestly, that's the only ranking that matters. I think in the first year, what was it, the first year of this, it was a number 16. It was Ohio State State, because they had lost a bad game at home. Uh, They were 16 in the first one, and they they got all the way there. Again, in 2014, there was a 2, a 5, a 6, and a 16. So three teams, not in the original Final Four, made it. In 2015, a 7 Michigan State and a 15 Oklahoma. Uh, made it. And then last year, a number five, Washington, number six, Ohio State. So it's going to happen. These four, let's just say it, these four, the odds are so strongly against the first four last night being the last four in. So who has the chance? Miami, as far as I'm concerned, they control their destiny. They still, now, again, as long as Notre Dame doesn't lose to Wake Forest this week and that game isn't as strong as it was, and, you know, those kind of things going on. But you can control and Wisconsin, you can get I know the the road to your Big Ten championship uh, uh, game isn't as strong, but once you get there, you're going to get a, a top team in Ohio State. You know, as long as Ohio State doesn't lose again, it, it's we're talking about teams. I don't think are, Wisconsin controls their destiny. I don't, no, I don't no, think I they're assured with, of anything. I agree with that. That I agree with. I think Miami does. I don't think Wisconsin does, which is kind of weird to say, but that's kind of where I think that was the one thing I really was surprised at when the rankings were going and, and how they count back our guys do. And when they got to 10 9, I was like, oh my gosh. The no love at all for those undefeated teams. Well, Miami has a, a Virginia Tech team coming up that yep. will be is ranked higher than any team Wisconsin will have played right. the entire season. Right. Then they get Notre Dame, who's three. 
then they would, in theory, get Clemson, who's four. Now, again, they, these well, teams don't have to be three and four. Exactly. We're, we're just projecting out a bunch of things. But you do this sort of the way you, you play blackjack. You assume that's going to be a 10, and that's going to be a 10, and that's going to be a 10, right. and what else is right. going to happen? Right. So if all those things happen, in my opinion, Miami, if they win out, gets in. Wisconsin, it's a question. I, I mean, agree. It, to me, it's questionable. I agree. The only reason I'll say I believe they get in is that I just can't believe, politically speaking, and I know those people in that room aren't supposed to take this into account, but how can you not? I can't imagine a circumstance in which an unbeaten Power Five conference champion gets left out. I just can't picture it. I don't care what else happens. It's so wild. I isn't can't it? picture it. It doesn't mean it can't. It doesn't mean that it shouldn't. But I can't see it happen. Here, here's the great setup to me: is Notre Dame winning out? Most people think they're in. Correct. I definitely I think so. Think they're in. Georgia, Alabama. We've talked. I, I said this since week two. I think they're going to meet. Undefeated in the SEC championship game. And if it is a last second close game win for either side, could you imagine both them still getting in? Because I could. one of them would only have one loss. Yes, I that could see. That leaves it. one spot for, say, a Clemson that wins the ACC, an Oklahoma that wins a Big 12, an Ohio State that wins a Big 10. If, if those three, since they were next there, if they do that, only one of them can get in. In, in and that circle, would be out. yeah. In that circle, well. Look, there's a million yeah, permutations. Oh, that's the fun of this. Let's exactly. Let's pause on that because that, that's the one circumstance where the Big Ten championship game becomes critical. Because if it is Ohio State and Wisconsin and Ohio State gets the win, then Ohio State, even having lost that game to Oklahoma, would have that huge win at the very end. Because Wisconsin, if they don't lose another game, and they probably won't, will move up a little bit, you would think, as this thing goes on. They'll be a top 10 team for sure, and they might even be 7 or 8. We'll see. That's why this stuff is fun to talk about. It's magnificent for sports talk because anything can happen, and we can sit here and imagine it all. All right, we are Mike and Mike, and at this time, it is my pleasure to welcome Mike Olick Jr. into the conversation. I don't... Oh, there it is. They yeah. moved his song on there you me. Go. Uh-huh. Tricksters. Testing you. Swindlers. I just want to make sure that while I'm looking at a 270-degree angle to my left, there I can quickly see something that they have moved <laughs> from one place to another. Good morning, Mike Olick Jr. Good morning. 18 years in, they're finding ways to keep you guys... Yeah, listen, so, yeah. I, I, I got the earpiece going in and out. We're having a tough day, but we're... Oh, right, we're, my God. And you deal with that stuff so well. Well, I think that's, uh, that's the beauty of me. <laughs> Anyway, uh, we'll get obviously into the college football playoff rankings. I want to save that for a minute because once we get to that, I know that we're never going to get off. So let's first get your thoughts on what we saw last night, Game 6 of the World Series. It's been it's been so sensational in so many different ways, this series, with all of the drama. It seems terrific and appropriate that we'll get a decisive Game 7. What was your primary takeaway from last night? Uh, I, I think just the job by Dave Roberts and company of resisting the urge to doubt yourself. Like so often in sports, when we hear that cliche of ignore the noise, it's about not reading your press clip, a press clipping. It's about what Nick Saban always talks about and the rat poison that the media is usually feeding your team. But for Dave Roberts and company, especially the way we saw their stress bullpen kind of get beat around on short rest, which I know is going to be more the case tonight, but it can get you in the mode of maybe doubting yourself and say, you know what? Maybe we do leave Rich Hill a little bit longer in last night because he is cruising, but they stuck to their guns they started their relievers in you know in the middle of that sixth inning where you had guys on second and third like you had a critical moment where you could have said I can go with what feels right with what everyone wants me to do on the outside or I can do with what's got us here I can do with what I know and I can stick by our plan and it worked out for them because they were process driven and not result driven you know what you know to reminded me of and, and you bring up the example a lot is and Mike plays a lot well is blackjack like, 16 is on. If the dealer, to me, has a 7 or higher, I'm hitting. Every time. I, I, I'm, and and there, there are those that don't. And, and they all sometimes will apologize at a table. I said, listen, don't apologize. Just be consistent. If you're going to do it, just do it every time. Don't, like, have a feel, which is it, it, it different in cards for the feel because the cards are the cards as opposed to a gut feeling for a manager. But you saw it in Game 2, Dave Roberts stuck to the game plan, and it didn't work. And now you saw it in Game 6, stuck to the plan, and it did work. But here's a, an analogy I'll make just to take it a step farther. You're supposed to do that, and you're hitting on 16. You're hitting on 16. Yeah. Now you've brought a certain amount of money that you're going to play with tonight, and you're not playing with anymore, and you're down to your last chip. Your last chip is on the table. Do you still hit on yes, 16? I absolutely The do. point is you're supposed to, but a lot yeah. of people will get a little yeah. gun shy, and that's where we are. To do that in Game 6 of the World Series, Mikey, is your point. He hit on 16 with his last chip on the table. Because the minute you start going too much by feel, doubting yourself and doing things that just feel right at the time, not consistent with an ideology, you become the Cleveland Browns. 
I, you know what? I, I agree with that to a point, but can we go all analytics? You, it's tough for me to believe that in game two, if you didn't keep Rich by, a, you know, Dave Roberts said, you know, I know we're supposed to take him out now, but dude, what do you have, seven strikeouts at that point or something like that, Hembo? I mean, he was dealing. My point is, though, is that it doesn't matter whether you're all analytics or you're all normal baseball, but you've got to have that consistency, and that's the reason we saw Girardi out with the Yankees, was talking to Hembo about that this morning, is when you don't have people on the same page. That's the problem with Cleveland. Right. Not that they've bought yeah. into one ideology, but that they've bought into neither ideology, and that they exist somewhere in limbo, and when you've got that disconnect between front office and manager, coach, whoever you want it, you're never going to succeed. Yeah, listen, I guess I can't really complain too much. They stuck with their their ways. They hit 916. They're in Game 7 of the World Series right now at home. So <laughs> Yeah, and, and what do players always say? How many times did Mark Schlereth, who started in three Super Bowls, say that the key is to treat it like any other game as soon as you can make it like any other game? Well, this is how the Dodgers played their games. This is how they won over 100 games during the regular season, and this is how they handled Game 6 of the World Series. So again, Game 7 is tonight. And what was the stat that I saw in there about a game sevens between teams that each had a hundred wins. Oh yeah, it happened. Uh, uh, it happened two other times as far as winner take all World Series game between one hundred win teams all time. It's this year, back in nineteen thirty one, the A's and the Cardinals. So it hasn't happened since nineteen thirty. And then nineteen twelve, it was the Giants and the Red Sox. Cardinals won the series, and the Red Sox won the. Series. My goodness, this is the first time game. since nineteen. 19- so that's the year before my father was born. Yeah, this is the last time that we had a winner take all in a in a World Series between two teams. That had each won 100 yeah. games during the season. Looking forward to it tonight. Mikey's here with the Straight Talk, brought to you by Straight Talk Wireless. Best phones, best networks, no contracts. All right, Mike, let, let me ask you this then, uh, along the same lines. We see the college football playoff rankings, the first ones of this year, come out. I'll ask you the same question. What was the, the primary takeaway you had from last night? The primary takeaway I heard last night actually was what I heard from Kirby Hokett, and it was kind of reinforced by something our own Booger McFarland said, which is that head-to-head matters right now. Yeah, (laughs) head-to-head matters right now, and it was a point I heard Booger made, and it's one that I think serves well in a lot of senses for this, which is that we should absolutely value head-to-head, but we should also understand when and how those things occur. Like Ohio State and Oklahoma played, and Oklahoma won that game early in the season. Watch how they develop. You can even say that for Alabama, who a lot of people are downgrading that Florida State win. That was DeAndre Francois Florida State that they played. They played the good version of Florida State before that, before the hurricane displaced them, before that season got thrown out of whack. So always having context for, all right, yeah, we've got these bullet points that we're supposed to value, conference championships, head-to-head wins, strength of resume, all that stuff. But we also have to say, all right, what's the context that we're watching it and always make sure that we've got the appropriate framework. I, I, uh, I, I love the way Booger put it. He said they did go head-to-head, but he goes, that Ohio State-Oklahoma game was so long ago, I lost 15 pounds since that <laughs> game. He goes, so I, I get it. That's the thing I guess we always wonder with the committee because it's 13 human beings is, what do they value, and when do they value it? So that head-to-head is valued now, but six weeks from now, five weeks from now, will it be valued the same way? I also That's what think I don't know. If, if I were sitting in that room, and look, this is now being decided by these individuals, and, and regardless of what is written down on that long piece of paper or multiple pieces of paper with the different criteria, ultimately each of them will make up their own minds in their own ways. You tell me, is it fair to say – that the body of work over the course of the entire season, the beginning part of it is devalued. Are we just trying to pick who's playing best now, or are we picking who actually accomplished the most during the season? Because regardless of whether Ohio State is playing better now or not, and we're basing that on one One huge come-from-behind win in the fourth quarter against Penn State, but forgetting that for the moment, that game happened. If it Even even in December, it will still have happened. And if we're saying, well, these teams have developed a long way since then, we're basically saying that game didn't matter that much. And there's something about that that doesn't feel right to me. We always do that, though. Like, we do some version of that all the time. The year Ohio State won the national championship, what'd they do? They dropped a game to Virginia Tech very early in that right. season. And we don't value early season losses as much as we do late season losses because you're not the full extent of your team then. We go into every season saying we want to be the best version of ourselves in November in college football. We're trying to crescendo to that moment. So we always do some version of that. And the committee showed you last night, though, that there's still a ton of value in what you've actually accomplished. That's why George is number one. Because on a neutral site, Alabama 
Alabama's favored by 10 points or whatever Vegas says already. I don't think any of us are disputing that. Right. But Georgia's accomplished more so far. Alabama's schedule doesn't look as daunting as Georgia's had in the early going. And so the committee rewarded that. Notre Dame is being rewarded for especially what they've done in recent weeks and for having a good loss, that level of accomplishment. The reason I'm scared is because a team like Oklahoma's got a chance to accomplish a lot against TCU at Bedlam against Oklahoma State. Like You've got points like that where you can still, and the clear, uh, committee has clearly said, all right, that's stuff that matters to us. That much we can take away. It's been ingrained into us that what you are at the beginning of the season is not what you are at the end of the season. In the NFL, it's easy because you make the playoffs and you're in. Nobody has to vote you in That's here. what I'm saying, yeah, is, here. is that in all professional sports, every game counts exactly as much as every other game counts. In college, it doesn't, doesn't. and it are doesn't. we saying that's okay? Well, I think I think you, you put it that way because there's no preseason in college. Your first game is your first game, so... Nobody comes out of the gate saying, you watch, even, even the great Alabama, you watch them play in game one and then in the national championship game, a lot of times it's not the same team or they're, they're going to get incrementally better throughout the season. So I, I guess there's part of me that can see less value on the early games as you're kind of finding your way. It, it seems odd because it's still a game and it still counts. So, but when you're on the scale of, of justice, you know, where does it weigh as, as, as a, as, compared to a Week 10 or a Week 11 game. Well, yeah, and that's one of those things that always becomes interesting, especially because it's also kids. Like, the reason we can't compare it to professional sports is because these aren't professionals. We're reminded of that over and over again in different facets, but we can't pick and choose where we treat them like that. So if we're going to say this is amateur athletics, then you have to understand the 18- to 23-year-olds, especially ones coming in that are asked to play early, are going to develop at a different pace than, let's say, guys in the NFL in their ninth and 10th year. And I think it is important to remind everyone and ourselves that last year, Year, Ohio State beat Oklahoma in a similar early game, and I think in everyone's estimation that got them into right. the Final Four. And so it, it was form, yeah. counted significantly. Okay, Mike and Mike and Mike will take a short break. We'll come back. Kirk Street will join this conversation off the top of the next hour as well. It's a jam-packed Wednesday. Stay with us. Back in just a moment. So for players with style today, let's talk about Halloween costumes. Obviously, we all looked fabulous on Halloween. We did. Which athlete did we think had the most interesting or most spectacular Halloween costume? I thought that uh, I thought LeBron's Pennywise was fantastic. I really thought it was good. I th- and I also thought that he has throws a great uh, party, a Halloween party, that Dwayne Wade and his wife, Gabrielle Union, did you see where they were? They were Millie, Millie Vanilli. Vanilli. Mm-hmm. With, uh, I thought that was pretty cool as well. Yeah, the NBA decidedly outclassed the yep. NFL in the Halloween costumes. Shout out to Steph Curry, man. That was a convincing jigsaw. I don't know where he found the appropriate size tricycle, but it was very it was well positioned. Really I also enjoy, I like the reveal. We showed that yesterday. Yes. And if you don't know who it is, if you don't know that it's from Aisha Curry and you have no idea who this might be, and then all of a sudden he pulls up the mask and it's Steph Curry. I, I like the way he did the reveal. Yeah, that was that was pretty cool. Now you you didn't wear a costume last night. You you do that. You after the college football show rankings every Tuesday. You and Jason Fitz are going to do a yeah a thing on Twitter, right? Twitter reaction show. There'll be a radio component to it as well. But Fitzy and I. Uh will be on Twitter doing a live stream, a periscope of reaction to the college right, football right. playoff rankings. Last week. night, and you're doing it at your house. Yes. Yeah. And he, he wore like a, he was on a thing where it looked like he was on a bull or the something. The inflatable. The inflatable. Yes, bull. Okay. And you wore a Notre Dame shirt because Notre Dame was number three in the rankings. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I was a washed up student athlete. What <laughs> was the what was the primary um, area of question you were getting in, in the Periscope? like what, what were most of the people upset about or asking you? Most of the question was about who can be sort of the party crashers laid on here. Like we saw in the first year of it, team outside of the top ten that you think has a chance to weasel their way into the playoffs or who has a chance What's to the answer to that? the party. I said Oklahoma State. They've got a chance to get a big win against Oklahoma at Bedlam and then potentially the Big 12 championship. That's a team that was better than the TCU team that they played. Talk about head-to-head mattering. I kept watching the tape on that one and wondering when the TCU team that was better was going to show up. So, uh, again, the worst in the initial ranking, the the lowest-ranked teams that got into the Final Four in 2014, it was a number 16 Ohio State, and the next year it was a number 15 Oklahoma. So it's happened two of the three times. So it's a fair question to ask who may crash that party because you certainly have a, a big number of one loss to undefeated team. Yeah, look at Virginia Tech in the ACC too, who's still going to play. Yeah, uh, Miami this still week. has Miami yeah. coming up this week. And uh, they then, lost, you know, I think believe they lost to Clemson. They already. did. Yes. 31-17. That's yeah. their only loss. Right. 
Uh, I don't. I don't think. I, if you're asking me who can get it, I mean, are we, if we're including nine and ten, I think the teams at nine and ten both can win their way out and get their way in. Miami a lock. I think Miami's a lock if they run the table, right? Right. Beat Virginia Tech beat, beat Notre, Notre Dame, Dame, beat Clemson in the ACC title. And game. Wisconsin. Can you see any way, regardless of the schedule? Regardless of the fact that their best conference win going into the conference, candidly, their best win overall going into the conference championship game would probably be Northwestern. Do you think that if they were to win out and beat, let's say, Ohio State in the Big Ten title game, Mikey, is there any way they get left out? Man, if you've got, it depends on that SEC championship game again. So much seems to ride on that one. But I got to imagine undefeated Power Five it ends up being like Washington last year, where because of what that would mean in other places, they're going to wind up. I, I, it'd be hard to keep them out if Ohio State was a two-loss team if they got knocked off again and still made it to the Big Ten championship. Which they can. So, Ohio State can lose one more game and, and still, still wind up representing the their half of the Big Ten. It would be 10. hard to think you could be in the Power Five undefeated. But go to my scenario, what I said, the SEC, two undefeated. Close game. You could see them both being in. A lot of people think if Notre Dame runs the table, they're in. That leaves one spot for a Big Ten champ, an ACC champ, a Big 12 champ, a Pac-12 champ. I mean, that, 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 that would be really, really interesting. What a drought, potentially, if this all holds chalk the way we think it might for the Pac-12, like outside of year one just being absent from this for the next three well, Washington. Well, Washington, Washington, Washington what am Washington I thinking about last year? year. Why yeah, do I, yeah, I think yeah. about? I guess we downgrade Washington like we do anything else. The, the, the team, the, the conference had been the Big Twelve, and yeah. they finally have a championship game now to try and. I mean, I can't believe it took. They were hard headed in not doing this. And there's a lot of people I see that are saying, you know, about our school, about Notre Dame, saying there's no way Notre Dame should get in if they're not in a conference and don't play that extra conference championship game. Uh, so they should be left out until they join a conference. And what I've always said, I don't know if you agree, Mike. About Notre, and I said Notre Dame won't join a conference until they see it physically hurt their chances to see them get left out to make a run. If they were to go 11-1, and their only loss to be to a number 1 Georgia team and them get left out, that would be a clear sign that to them may be saying, you know what, we may have to rethink this. And you know what, they should write a thank you card when they do get in for all this to Ohio State because last year you proved that conference championship is not the only barrier to entry in all of this, and that would be Notre Dame's biggest feather right. in their cap. If Notre Dame is in the final four, the top four, excuse me, in the penultimate rank, Games. Right, and then the, that last weekend happens, and all those teams play their conference championship games, and Notre Dame gets knocked out. That's when you say, "Okay, yep. we have to rethink this, right. and we have to join a conference." Yeah, yep. that's exactly right. So, one other question I wanted to ask because I heard you talking about it this morning. How, by the way, Greeny, how was your? Do you have a lot of kids in it? We did. We got we got hit hard. I. I I did a poor job of candy dispersal, and I'll explain oh, why in a moment. Oh, very boy. poor. Oh, how about boy. very I, poor? I like what you talked about this morning. The the loser candy. The candy that's left at the bottom of the barrel. Yeah, we have a lot of debate in in talk radio and in, nay in this country about the best candies that are out there. But I always wonder in the morning after in the remnants when you go and look in that candy bowl, what are the ones left at the bottom of your family's candy bowl? Because mine, like I have a bo bowl full of Almond Joys Almond at home. Joy. We had a bunch of Whoppers over in the radio building this morning. So that's, I, that's kind of my question. Adding to it, I think, is Swedish fish. I think those are the kind of the, Ooh. you know... Kind of the island of misfit toys. No, you're getting a lot of cross-eyed looks on that. Swedish fish. People love Swedish fish. I am. I'm looking at a table outside full of Swedish fish. That, and that means people brought in candy that was left over. Was Bickler's fish. eating one right now. The proof if, is in if, the fish. If we're putting that on Bickler, that it's popular because Bickler eats it, then forget it. Makes me really hard to align myself with Swedish fish now. Probably Thanks, Travis. By the way, tomorrow night, Mike and I are be calling uh, Navy Temple on ESPN Thursday Night Football. Uh, so we'll be out in Philadelphia. We look forward to that. Yeah. If someone is now throwing Swedish fish at I'm not eating. I'm not eating the Swedish fish. All right, but Mikey is. We'll take a short break. Mike Olive Jr., thank you very much. Look forward to the game tomorrow night. Kirk Herbstreit with his thoughts on all this and more next. Mike and Mike. Dickler.